welcome to the BEC Bridge. On this, our third episode, it's all about contracts. I have Shane Thompson with me, and he's going to talk about the different types of contracts. And Melissa and I chat about how to vary contract terms. And of course, look out for our funny stories about HR. All of this and more as you join us on the BEC Bridge. This episode of the BEC Bridge was recorded at the stunning Portico One, located at Prospect Beach, St. James. Portico is one of the beautiful villas available in the Sotheby's Realty Catalog. Today we're talking contracts and I have with me Shane Thompson, attorney at law. Good afternoon, Sheena. How are you? I'm doing well. So let's dive right into it. Yes, please. So when we hear about contracts, we hear all of these terms floating around. Fixed term, temporary, um, permanent. Explain, what are the different types of contracts in the employment relationship? I'm actually glad you use the terminology types um, because I don't like to box them in. Yes, they're all contracts, but they all serve a different purpose. And I say to persons, the type really depends on what it is you're trying to achieve. So a fixed term contract is in the name where the period that the contractual relationship exists is fixed. So there's an end date. Generally in contracts like that, they do have an understanding either in writing or orally that the contract might be extended in those particular circumstances. Mm -hmm. Then the temporary contract, again, the name is a contract for temporary purpose. The conceptual difference between that and a fixed term contract might be, let's say, if you hired a temp who will only be there for a couple of weeks, for example, if your secretary is off or something like that, versus a fixed term contract where you're actually bringing in someone who is not necessarily holding on for someone else. They're there for their own specific purpose. Mm -hmm. um, an independent contractual relationship, again, that is what we call, which we will, I will you know, explain as much as I can now, but that's what we call mm -hmm. something like a contract for services. So, for example, an independent contractor would be someone you bring on who's not the main employee, who's providing you with a, a specific service. So, for example, an independent contractor, to make it very simply, would be if you hire your, con your contractor to build your house for you, that's a contract for services. He doesn't work for you, he's not an employee, etc. And then you have your usual employee contracts where the Conceptual difference again between that and an independent contract or a fixed term contract or a temporary, co temporary contract is generally speaking, you don't expect to have a end date for that contract with an employee. Um, you're, we are, for, you know, be agent parlance bring, bringing them on to staff. Mm -hmm. um, you usually pay NAS and POA and other statutory obligations, etc. All right. So we're going to pause here because yeah. that's a lot. Yes. And you mentioned something critical there, mm -hmm. a contract for services. Your lawyers don't make it easy, you know. One little preposition, two or three letter word makes a huge difference. So we hear contract for services, but then we also see contract of service. Yes. And, and it's just one word that's different. Yes. Explain that difference for me. Well, first of all, on behalf of my profession, we don't intend to make things difficult. <laughs> um, but, it, you know, when you are dealing with, because they say to people all the time, there's no such thing as a legal problem. It is a personal problem that has legal issues. And the reason are legal attendant consequences. And the reason that is important for what we're discussing is because the law really does try to account for as many personal situations as possible. In terms of a contract of service versus a contract for services, a contract of service is what we can categorize as your employee contract. And conceptually, what you can think of it is it really came out of a master servant traditional historical reality where you had one person was the master and another person was the service, was the servant, sorry. So they were providing, um, they were in service to the person, and that's where that came about. Oh. While a contract for services is literally where someone is providing you with services. So they have a particular capability, they have a particular, let's say, um, product or, or service that they're providing. <laughs> um, so you're not bringing them to 
you're they're your servant and you're the master they're not only connected to you they can work for other person they can make their own hours make their own time while that is conceptually different to a contract of service where because it's a master servant situation i as the master determine all of these things for you when you come in when you go how much you're paid when you're paid etc and I'm glad you spent some time explaining that because we did a poll with, the, with Barbados today, uh -huh. BEC and Barbados today. And when we asked Barbadians um, what they thought while well, the type of relationship was, that was established by a contract of service, uh -huh. we got a mixed bag. And actually, it's clear that persons didn't understand the difference between the two, contract of service and contract for services. So some persons actually did think it created a normal employment relationship. 37% of the respondents thought it did. Mm -hmm. So it's very important that of versus for makes a huge difference in that contractual relationship. Yeah, I would say if I can, that the honest truth, you don't, I wouldn't even blame Barbados for that misunderstanding. Um, and I think that, even though it sounds like I'm contradicting myself from earlier, it isn't an intention for the law to make it complicated or for attorneys. Um, but because life in and of itself is not necessarily black and white. Mm -hmm. And it's because you do have that confusion, for lack of a better term, that there are a slew of authorities, legislative and cases that deal with that specific issue where there's clearly a position on one end as to the nature of the contract, whether it's for services or of services, and that position on one end, usually the employees or the person who is claiming that it's a particular type of contract is different from the position on the other end, the person who's saying it's not the contract you're claiming it to be. And we usually see them in situations where it's an employee, employer in quotation marks, um, where it's being argued, and it's usually when the person has been dismissed or they want some type of benefit that they're trying to qualify for. And then there's a conversation about, wait a minute, how, are, how have I actually been engaged under a contract for services or a contract of service? So I don't blame the Barbadian public for not understanding that. So employers have to make a choice in terms of what type of contract that they want to have um, in order to get the services that they need. Mm -hmm. Now, let's go to case law, let's go to legislation. Uh -huh. And I know there's some pointers there. Yes. So, over to you, Shane. Tell us. <laughs> Here's what I would say to you firstly. I always say to employers a couple of things. One, that when you are getting um, or determining what type of contract you should engage someone with, you first actually need to go to someone for advice. And I don't even mean just attorneys, just someone who understands these things, whether it be BEC or somebody else. The second thing you need to determine is what is it that you're trying to achieve, which is why I started about with that at the beginning of the, when we started speaking. What are you trying to get out of this person in, in terms of conceptually before we get to what the law says? Are you in a situation where you need them to be in, in your office from this time to this time? You need them to be able to answer your calls at all times. Or are you just trying to get a particular project, let's say, off the ground? And once it's done within six months, you don't care if the person finish it within the first three weeks or they take the entire six months. Once you figure that out, then you're correct. There is a lot of authority on what type of contract you choose for of services, etc. Once you figure out conceptually what you want. So, for example, um, we do have, I'm just going to name quickly because it's not a law class. We do have three cases we have hunting the life of Barbados, but even though it says life of Barbados, it's actually an Antiguan and Barbudan case. And that is important because it does um, interpret their code, but it does give some very good pointers on what is an employee contract, employee employment versus independent contractor. Here, we have cases from, we have two cases specifically that I like to use. Um, one is called Sajikar and Carter. And that is the case that Sir David Simmons would have yes. done. And the other case that I also like to use is Alico against Henderson Franklin. Mm -hmm. um, and Alico against Henderson Franklin actually refers to Sadie Corn Carter. Mm -hmm. And importantly, those two cases um, do a couple of things. Making it digestible. What they do is they point out that there is no one way to determine 
whether there is an employee employee relationship or independent contractor. And that was important because prior to those cases, there was a belief that the, what we call the control test. Yes. And it was the only con mm -hmm. test that you could use. And what those cases pointed out were that the control test is just one, really, in a, in a numeral test that you could use. And it's not one situation where it's right over an X. Sorry. One of that list that we find in the first schedule of the ERA. Yes, yes. right. <laughs> so they're saying, you know what, we used to believe traditionally that for you to determine whether this person was an employee versus an independent contractor, you can employ the, the control test. But what Alico, for example, did, which was an appeal decision, is that the first instance judge actually said, no, I don't find that that test is applicable at all to these circumstances. And that was upheld on appeal. Um, and in Sajikor, which came before Alico, so David Simmons made the point again that this belief that the control test is the only test that you can use is actually not correct. He, in the holding, he actually found a couple of the tests, and I'm going to list a couple because they relate to the ERA. And he pointed out the economic reliability test. He pointed out the organizational integration test. Again, he pointed out the control test. He pointed out the continuity test, etc. But the point he distilled it down to is this. There's no one test that's better than the other. You can use a myriad of tests if you so desire. But what you're really looking at is to see the way the parties operate with each other to determine whether or not it is employee versus employer, employee, employer, or independent contractor. So what I like to say, sorry. I want to say, Shane, I think that point is critical and we need to reiterate that. Yeah. It is how the parties operate and not simply what is in writing. And let me, which is what I'm about to say. So let me taking it a little further. I say to people all the time, so the law really isn't interested in what you're saying should happen according to your contract. It's interested in what is actually happening yes. on the ground. And we're looking to see how are you operating with each other. And that is important because when you go over to the ERA or the Seventh Payments Act, really, they actually have in schedule in the schedules, a specific ERA schedule one, they actually have factors to be considered. Mm -hmm. And the reason that I say it's to be considered is as a matter of interpretation, we as attorneys say that that really means it is on an exhaustive list. So if, for example, an issue arises or a factor arises that for whatever reason you are not seeing it there, it does not mean that it is not something you could consider to determine whether or not it is an independent contractor versus employee. And that situation under the ERA, for example, deals with conceptually, even if not the same wording, what comes under the cases. So things like, am I providing exclusive um, time to service the employer? Service to the services? employer. Is it continuous? Are statutory obligations coming out? Am I bringing my own tools? Am I bringing my own tools? <laughs> am I hiring persons to assist me? Is there any type of financial risk on my part? Where is the money going? How am I really relating to you? Are, am I subject to your policies? Are you, have you integrated me into the organization as a matter of necessity to be able to do this job? Um, can I come and go say, please, those type of things. And those are really the, again, factors, not necessarily the test, that help establish whether or not the way the parties deal with each other should be considered employee, employer, or independent contractor. And I think this is a very important point because when it comes to the relationship, um, what you highlight, excuse me, what you highlighted is that you have to first look at what do you want to establish? How do you envision this person operating within your business or outside of your business and just giving a service? And then you have your contract mirror those expectations. That is correct. And then you won't have those questions of, I have one thing in writing and I operate another way. It's about making sure what you put in writing, because you should put it in writing, that make sure what you have in writing mirrors what actually happens. And you know, that's, I'm so glad you said that because, you know, you and I were talking very casually about it and we were saying that these things only ever become an issue when they become an issue. And before everybody's kind of going along, you know, very casually, like, mm. Rather, you know, it's independent contractor or employee. It really doesn't matter. I get my money when the month come. I can live my life, whatever. And that's actually how the cases at Alico and like Barbados and Sajikor came about. And why those cases I find are really good to illustrate the point is because they deal with an industry where there's almost a gray area yes. as to whether or not the I was sitting here employee. thinking they're all insurance cases. Correct. And that's mm -hmm. why I use them because the way agents come about, you know, they will always say, I'm a Sajikor agent. And then in a lot of those cases as well, 
there was a lot of transition back and forth where agent was used in terms of how you were engaged and then agent was taken out. So then you had the person who was engaged on the one hand thinking, oh, well, I'm an employee um, because my NAS is being taken out, my POA is being taken out. But then you have the insurance company on the other hand saying, well, not really because we've listed you as an agent. And all of those cases either came out where, one, the person was dismissed, contract was terminated, then you realize you can't get unemployment, you can't get certain things because you're an independent contractor. Um, so, I, so you're right in saying that on both ends, really, when you as a person who is giving out a contract, and I use it in that terminology because if you're an independent contractor and you're giving your services away to someone, then you need to be clear on what it is that you want to happen in this relationship. Yes. And, then the, and then the employee, the person who is getting the service as well, whether they're organization or not, they need to be clear, okay, you know what? Yes, you're an independent contractor and an employee, and then the reverse is true. Um, so I always say to people, just really, really conceptualize. And if you know, and I can be honest now, if you know, as I've been all day, if you know, you really want an employee, you want to control someone time. Don't play you getting an independent contract or contract so you could avoid paying NAS and POA. I, I have to different. agree with you on that point. <laughs> yeah. We always advise persons, what do you want to achieve? And then you set up the contract to do yeah. that. I if agree. you want an employee, it's better to have an employment contract, whether it is temporary because you only want them for a short time, yeah. whether it is permanent part-time, that's a yes. new phrase. Yes. So you know you don't need that person for eight hours a day, that is fine. Yes. You can have an employment contract yes. for four hours a day yes. and that person can work for those four hours for five years if that's the arrangement that you want to have. I know jokingly you and I were saying because either you pay now or you pay later and that comes about because if you are found to be an employee, this to be an employment contract, and you have not been paying the statutory obligations, you've not been deducting the statutory obligations, the, reg the, the, the bodies will come after you for their money. Yes. Interest is at 1% at NAS for the five years of your independent contract that you were supposed to pay national insurance. So why do you think you're avoiding this money, quote unquote, up front, because you're not paying the obligations as the person's an independent contractor? then a court says, mm, actually, they're an employee. And suddenly national insurance is ready to tell you, well, please and thank for our $75,000 in back payments. And you we know? don't want that to happen. <laughs> Correct. But we're just out of time. Oh. Um, it's been great chatting yes, with you. I think we've had some very good takeaways as part of our conversation. Yes. And I just want to remind our viewers, our listeners, that when it comes to employment contracts, get advice. You have attorneys, you also have the BEC, you have specialists in the field. We can advise you on the type of contract that will suit your situation so that you can avoid any fallout should the relationship come to an end and it's not a mutually um, agreed decision to end that relationship. So once again, I want to thank Shane thank for, for joining me, me and for us having that good conversation around employment contracts. Yes. And I'm sure persons would have taken away some golden nuggets that they're able to utilize in the future. So thank you. This is Nothing Surprises Me, I work in HR. Today, I have Patricia White with me. Patricia is the Manager of Employment Relations at the Barbados Employers Confederation. Thank you. And Patricia, you know, since we started this podcast, we've been getting some stories, some funny HR stories. So let me share one with you and get your take on it. So we have a disciplinary hearing is being held and the representative and attorney at law says in the meeting, I am paid to bark, so I'm going to bark, and then proceeds to tell the employee not to respond to any questions. Tell me, what's your take? Well, we know that that's not the right way, um, the right advice for the attorney to give his client. Um, the attorney is there in the disciplinary meeting as a companion or a friend. While he may be a practicing attorney at law, when he's in the hearing, he's not an attorney, and he should encourage the employee to be as cooperative as possible. Um, not to be combative, but to provide the employer with as much information as they can to get the case um, settled as quickly as, as possible. I completely agree. So tell me, 
you received any stories? Yes, I certainly did. We had um, one with a gentleman who was employed for five years at a company and he got through with another job and he resigned and two weeks after he came back very irate and upset that he was not paid out for the five years that he was there. I found that a bit funny. Well, it's true. We have this culture where we believe once you leave a job, you're entitled to money. But the fact is, severance is only due for situations such as redundancy. Correct. So you're perfectly fine to resign, but that doesn't mean the company owes you money. Correct. Thank you so much for joining me and for allowing us to have that discussion around those two stories. You're you know, HR is one of those things where you always get a good story. Yep. So once again, that has been Nothing Surprises Me, I Work in HR. On today's Spotlight on Employment Law, I have Melissa Green with me. Melissa is one of the advisors at the BEC and we're talking about contracts. So Melissa, you know, our conversation is all about contracts today. And, you know, just before we started, we were talking about the different terms that you find in a contract. Definitely. And more importantly, persons may be familiar with terms that are expressed and also terms which are implied. So, yes. We know about employee terms, those things that you don't find in writing, yes. but we know exist. Definitely, Sheena, because there are terms which are expressed, and then there are those which are implied. That's true. We always think about the what we can read in that contract, yeah. but the implied terms, you're not going to find in writing anywhere. You're not going to see it in writing that you have a duty to perform your job with reasonable skill. Right. That's not going to be in writing, but it's expected. Yes, definitely. Okay, so how would you advise someone to go about varying contract terms? So maybe hours of work are one of those other terms. How can an employer go about varying those terms? Um, so there are ways which, uh, where an employer can adjust their contractual hours between the relationship between the employee and the employer. And I would advise, I always advise having, start by having that conversation with the employee. Start there. And you know, in the case where it is a unionizing environment, you may also want, you would also want to engage your, the union and see how you can, you know, introduce the change to the employee. Um, if you don't do that, then, you know, there are some implications that can follow. That is true. So the power of mutual agreement, Yes. you know, th that's the best way to change the contract. If we can get both get parties yes, to definitely. get that buy-in. Yes. yes. So I agree with you, um, but we know sometimes it's not that simple. <sighs> and we have situations where you might have a long negotiation to try to come to that, mm -hmm. that end point. But you were just hinting about not doing things unilateral. Yes. So if you don't have agreement, then um, what is a possible outcome if employers don't handle those situations correctly? Uh, unfortunately, if you do not handle the situation correctly, employers may be faced with unfair dismissal claims or constructive dismissal. You know, where there is an award, if it is proven that there was indeed an unfair dismissal, it, would, it may result in the, um, the employer having to pay an award to the employee. Yes. So, you know, at the BEC, we would want employers to avoid that. Yes. So we want to, once again, highlight the power of mutual agreement. Mm -hmm. So if you want to vary contractual terms, you do that. And then we have the ERA, which tells us, the Employment Rights Act, which reminds persons that they need to have those changes in writing. Yes. Those employment particulars are definitely important as you begin your relationship between employee and employer. Yes. So thank you so much, Melissa. You know, we had our discussion around the fact that mutual agreement is necessary yes. and that if persons need help, mm -hmm. you know, they can always reach out to us. Yes. And we will help employers to guide them through if they need to vary those contractual terms. Definitely. Right. Thank you so much. That has been our Spotlight on Employment Law. is the voice of employers on employment-related matters. 
we are keen to develop policy that promotes national development. We are actively engaged on various pieces of labour legislation, including the Holiday with Pay Act, the Employment Rights Act, as well as minimum wage legislation. Under our training portfolio is where we share knowledge and information, and Sharice is here to share what's happening in April with you. Coming up in April, we have two training sessions. On Tuesday, April 4th, we have Holidays with Pay Act, and on the 18th to 20th, we have a three-day workshop called the Industrial Relations Academy. So this is going to be giving persons um, quite some interesting insight into industrial relations. For more information, browse our website at barbadosemployers.com, navigate through our calendar to register for any of these sessions, or feel free to email me at training at barbadosemployers.com. Let me express thanks for all who made this episode of the BEC Bridge possible. And a special thank you to Shane Thompson, our legal expert. You can find the BEC on Twitter, on Instagram, or on Facebook, or feel free to join and browse our website at barbadosemployers.com. Now turning to the national conversation, we are hearing about inclusion of persons with disabilities into the workforce. We have a new piece of legislation on preventing discrimination in the workforce. Given that, you will want to join me next month as we delve into diversity and inclusion all as we build connections via the BEC Bridge.